What separates these from anything else that we have in our current inventory is quite simple. There's five observables that associate, when you look at something as a UAP, an identified error phenomena, as being truly unique. That's instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity, low observability, transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple environments or domains, and last but not least, in, in the vernacular, would be anti-gravity. The ability to fly with no wings, control surfaces, uh, no obvious signs of propulsion, even, frankly, not even a cockpit. Before we begin, I'm just going to bring everybody up to speed on what's been happening in the news for, like, for the last few years. So, last year, the Pentagon made an extraordinary statement. They said that UFOs are real, and it has videos to prove it. It released three pieces of footage shot from the targeting cameras of US Navy fighter jets, which show close encounters with fast-moving, strange-looking craft that the Navy pilots later said defied the known laws of physics. The Pentagon's statement, which is up there, was just one in a run of extraordinary recent developments that have turned UFOs from a punchline into a serious talking point. In May, Barack Obama said, there is footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. And in June this year, the US intelligence services released a report to Congress about the government's work on the UFO issue. So clearly, the conversation has changed radically. The US government's policy used to be to deny and discredit when it came to UFOs. So how did we get to where we are today. Well, one man who was instrumental to this is our next guest, Lou Elizondo. Uh, he is a former counterintelligence agent who from 2010 to 2017 ran the Pentagon's secretive $22 million program investigating military reports of UFOs. These days, the military don't call them UFOs because the term has become so stigmatized. They instead refer to them as UAPs, standing for Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. So Lou joined the Pentagon's UAP program as a skeptic. But during his time there, he became not only convinced that these things were real, but that they were interfering with military weapons platforms and operating in protected airspace with impunity. He also became convinced that they did not belong to any earthly nation state. Frustrated by an action on what he saw as a grave national security threat, he turned whistleblower and spoke to the New York Times which revealed the existence of the Pentagon's UAP program on its front page in December 2017, alongside interviews with pilots who had encountered these things. And since that 2017 New York Times expose, Lou has been briefing officials in Washington and working behind the scenes to compel the government to firmly establish a more transparent, thorough investigation into the phenomenon. And that's actually starting to happen. The new National Defense Authorization Act, currently making its way through Congress, requires that the government sets up a permanent office to study UAPs on a Defense Department-wide basis. So, Lou, welcome. Charlie, thank you so much. We have a lot so to much. talk about. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, and thank you, folks, for being with us here today. We're really looking forward to this. So, first things first, rationally, there are three options for what these aircraft are. They're either a U.S. military black project, they belong to a foreign government, like China or Russia, or are they, or they are of non-human origin? Uh, so talk us through why you think the final option is the most likely. Sure. Um, this was actually one of the fundamental questions we were trying to solve while in the Pentagon. Um, the first obvious question is, is it one of our secret technologies? And the answer is quite succinctly no. Um, and how do we know that? Well, for several reasons. First of all, I had access to, to all those programs and those type of programs. You don't typically uh, test these type of secret aircraft in and around areas where you're doing active maneuvers. Um, you, you tend to test them at secret test ranges like Area 51. Um, and uh, you certainly don't endanger uh, pilots' lives by testing this type of secret technology uh, without, without coordinating that through our joint staff. So we very quickly realized it wasn't our technology. The second option, as Charlie, you mentioned, is, is it uh, foreign adversarial technology? Is it Russian? Is it Chinese? 
And of course, when you, when you go through the historical documentation, certainly in our country, uh, and this documentation is official documentation, one realizes very quickly we've been seeing this technology for decades. And when you compare that to where we were, let's say, in the late 1940s and 50s, we were just uh, ex exploring and learning the secrets of the atom. We were unlocking its secrets. We had just entered the jet age, and we hadn't even been into space. And yet these, these technologies were outperforming anything and everything that we have. Uh, so if this was some sort of foreign adversarial technology that's been around for 70 years, this would be considered probably the worst intelligence failure my country has ever experienced, perhaps even eclipsing that of 9-11 of on an order of magnitude. So the last option is, well, if it's not our technology and it's not some sort of foreign adversarial technology, then then whose or, or what is it? And that's where we are now in the conversation, certainly with our lawmakers and our legislative branch and our executive branch. And so that's precisely what we're trying to figure out now is, is what exactly are these if they're not ours? So what's the most <coughs> persuasive documented UAP encounter that you can talk about? Sure. That's a, first of all, it's a great question. It's also a loaded question because there's a lot I can't talk about, which to me is probably even more persuasive if you had a chance to see just, just some of this data. Uh, what I can talk about is probably the most famous uh, case that we had. It was in 2004. It involved the USS Nimitz Carrier Strike Group. This is a nuclear-powered, uh, if you will, aircraft carrier along with a fleet of other vessels uh, nuclear powered and in some cases submarines. And so they were doing what they call workups or they were practicing before going out on a deployment. And they were out in 2004 in November uh, conducting operations off the coast of San Diego, California. And there you have uh, one of the escort ships with the latest uh, Spy One radar capability beginning to pick up some sort of weird anomaly. In fact, not only was it uh, the USS Princeton at the time uh, with this brand new radar system looking at this, which one could argue maybe was a radar glitch, but you also had an E-2 Hawkeye that was also in the air providing airborne radar. And both are now looking at some sort of object, we'll call it an object, coming in from 80,000 feet and within, within less than a second, now hovering 50 feet over the water. Um, so, so certainly something very perplexing, so perplexing in fact, that we decided to go ahead and launch uh, two of our F-18 um, aircraft, uh, Super Hornets. And so uh, as you had Commander Dave Fravor and uh, Commander Alex Dietrich, this is uh, Commander Dave Fravor, by the way, a Top Gun graduate and instructor. Uh, these people are trained to identify and, and determine the difference between an SU-22, a MiG-25, and a F-16 from 20 miles away and by the way, make a decision to, to shoot it down if necessary. Um, so they get vectored to, to the area, and the first thing they notice is some water roiling on, on the ocean. And so Dave decides, being, being the, the kind of pilot that he is, he's gonna go in and take a look at this. So he conducts a, a very, very evasive maneuver to get down and close uh, to what he describes as this white, looks like a tic-tac, literally like the, like the breath mint. And it's uh, about 40 feet long, there's no windows, no, no real wings or control surfaces, no obvious signs of propulsion, and yet this object is witnessed now by four separate individuals and two separate aircraft, um, bouncing back and forth almost like a ping pong ball right over the surface of the water. So as he goes down and, and to take a closer look at this, all of a sudden this thing begins to react to Commander Fravor's uh, evasive maneuvers. And, and really, as, as Commander Fravor's coming in for a better look, this thing begins to maintain its distance and almost uh, parlay, if you will, uh, and keep a distance from, from this aircraft. Um, so that tells us, first of all, it's intelligently controlled. And so as he decides this time, okay, I, I'm, not getting, I'm not getting anywhere here. I'm just gonna go aggressively and go for this thing. Full throttle goes in and, uh, if you will, for that quote unquote kill uh, to see what this thing is. And all of a sudden, like that, it's gone. It absolutely disappears over the horizon with, within, within about a second. Now, what's even more scary, which is in about five seconds afterwards, and we, we know this conclusively, we did the investigation, this object now is picked up once again on radar 60 miles away. And in fact, it is now at the rendezvous point waiting for them. 
And that rendezvous point, by the way, is a point that nobody knew other than the pilots where they were supposed to be. So somehow this not only anticipated their next move, but was able to get literally 60 miles. You can do the calculations if you want how fast that is in five seconds. So something certainly well beyond our capabilities even today, hypersonic velocity, instantaneous acceleration and, and whatnot. And that's, that's Dave Fravor up there. That is, that is yeah. Commander Dave Fravor, um, one of our best pilots. And also, I suppose what's been particularly compelling in the news stories is there's also these videos. Um, so I, I wonder if we, uh, in a second, can show the two UAP encounters from 2015. These are the videos that the Pentagon authenticated as being real last year. So why don't we play those, and then you can tell us what's so incredible about what we're sure. seeing. Can we roll the tape? There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. That's not our LNS though, is it? It's not. That is the LNS, dude. Well, if there's like another thing, it's rotating. going on there, Lou? <laughs> <laughs> well, <coughs> quite a bit, actually. <laughs> so in the, uh, the first video that you saw there, uh, it is uh, known as the gimbal video. And because of the, the, if you will, the orientation of this object that it, is, it, is, it's, it's, it has. When you look at this video, a couple things to the trained eye you'll begin to notice. First of all um, is the, the telemetry that you see on the screen is altitude. Now, when an aircraft banks, 90 degrees, you hear what they say, wow, it, it, this is compelling and the thing is rotating. Well, not only is it rotating, but it's not losing lift. So aircraft that have wings, whenever you're going to do a bank and you're going to turn, when you do that, you lose lift and you lose altitude. And yet this is not losing altitude. And as you hear them say, it's going 120 knots against the wind, right? So we're not talking about a balloon. At 25,000 feet, we're not talking about a, a quadcopter or a drone, and we're not talking about an aircraft. And if you look at that, it doesn't really look like an aircraft, does it? It looks, looks peculiar, it looks almost like a, like a top. And then furthermore, what you don't see on the video, but you hear in, in, in the exasperation of the, of the pilots, is that there's a whole fleet of them. And so what's important to know here, it's sometimes not just what you see on screen, but it's the complete picture. It's sometimes it's what you don't see and also what you can hear. And so part of our investigation was to go talk to the pilots and say, what exactly did you see, right? When you said there's a whole fleet of them, what did they look like? How were they maneuvering? What were they doing, right? And this is, this is probably one of the, the, the better videos that was released to the public. I will tell you there's a lot more videos that are, in my opinion, even far more compelling. They just haven't been released yet uh, because they, they still remain quite, quite sensitive, uh, classified to some degree. Um, but that's what you're seeing in that video there. The other one, if you want, I'm happy to walk through that one as well, but it's up to you. I'm not sure we have that one here. There, there, is, a, there is a video which is, I would say, a bit less uh, dramatic, because uh, there's no audio, of, um, of, the, of the, the Nimitz encounter, Correct. Isn't, isn't there? Yeah, and what that shows is basically the instantaneous acceleration. If I may, I'll just take 10 seconds. What separates these from anything else that we have in our current inventory is quite simple. There's five observables that associate, when you look at something as a UAP, an identified aerial phenomena, as being truly unique. That's instantaneous acceleration, hypersonic velocity, low observability, transmedium travel, the ability to operate in multiple environments or domains, and last but not least in, in the vernacular would be anti-gravity. The ability to fly with no wings, control surfaces, uh, no obvious signs of propulsion, even frankly, not even a cockpit. 
And that's, of course, what Fravor saw when he was up close, because he was much closer than these cameras are, right? That's and what all of our sheer, pilots are recording. Surface. Yeah. Um, so, look, I think we all want to know, do you think any government has recovered a crashed UAP? So what I've said for the record, uh, which is unfortunately all I, I can say, is that it is my uh, belief that the United States is in possession of, uh, of exotic material. And unfortunately, that's, that's, that's about all I can, I can say at this time. How worried are you about a foreign adversary uh, getting hold of this or maybe understanding this technology before the US? I think that's my greatest fear. Um, you know, we're a species that tends to um, be violent towards one another. And my job with national security uh, was to try to anticipate what the enemy is going to do. Uh, if there is an adversary that has this type of technology and the ability to, to operate without uh, impunity in our controlled U.S. airspace, um, I think that's problematic. Um, we spend millions of dollars ensuring we have what we call air domain awareness and control of our airspace. And uh, clearly, um, we don't have as much control as we, we think we do. So, you know, you, you were working for the government for a long time. You then chose to turn whistleblower. Um, were you worried about repercussions? Why, why haven't they shut you up? Well, <laughs> probably because I'm pretty public at this point. Um, that's, a, that's a multifaceted question that requires several answers. Let me, let me if I can, be as frank as possible. Um, there is a strong undercurrent in our country of, uh, of uh, individuals in our government particularly that know the seriousness of this topic. And what I've said before is this is not a topic that is similar to, let's say, fine French wine, where the longer you keep a cork on it, the better it gets. Um, this is a conversation rather more like uh, spoiled vegetables in the refrigerator. And the longer you leave it there, the more it is, going to, it is going to smell. And so we should probably begin to address this issue sooner rather than later, because whether or not these are real, you, that's no longer up for debate. This is, this is a fact. This is, we're here, folks. Uh, the question is, what is it? Where is it from? What is its intent? Uh, and, and what can or should we be doing about it? And there was a pretty extraordinary statement by the serving administrator of NASA a few days ago, wasn't there? <laughs> Do you just want to talk us through that? Yeah, well, um, he's one of many. We've had uh, now uh, former directors of our Central Intelligence Agency, former directors of National Intelligence, uh, former presidents of the United States, uh, former and current members of our Congress, both Senate and the House of Representatives, and now uh, our current administrator for NASA, all uh, acknowledging the reality that this is real. Um, again, I think once you, you take away the, the, the tin foil, notion of tinfoil hats and, and, and you know, nonsense like that, and we look at this from a national security perspective, we can start having a fair and rational conversation without the, the associated stigma and taboo. So supposing these are of non-human origin, do you think these are like drones, remotely controlled? Or do you think there's something piloting them? Well, they're certainly intelligently controlled, as we saw with Dave Fravor and other examples I can't discuss here, uh, where they are reacting to our action. So uh, there, is a, there is a stimulus and there is certainly a response. So uh, this isn't some sort of random atmospheric anomaly or something like that. So they are intelligently controlled. The question is what and who is controlling them? And, and that is precisely what we are trying to figure out today. You got any th theories? Um, you know, let me, let me, let me say one thing. Um, there have been moments in our species, paradigm moments, um, in our lifetime, not so much, but as a species, it happens quite a bit. Um, uh, there are these paradigm moments that, that push the evolution of, of, of our species, mankind. The first one perhaps is when we came out of the cave and we looked at the stars and we realized our universe, our world just got a lot bigger. The second time perhaps was when, when two stones were struck together, created a spark, and all of a sudden we, we began to illuminate the, 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 the darkness around us. The third time was probably when a couple folks, probably like us, were standing on a beach and someone said, you know what, I'm going to sail over the horizon. And of course, people said, no, you don't want to do that. The earth is flat and there's sea monsters out there. And of course, now we kind of chuckle and look back and, and laugh about it. But in reality, you know what, there really are sea monsters. They're just called great white sharks and blue whales and the great squid of the Pacific. And we realize that they're not really sea monsters. They're just part of nature. They're part of our reality. They're part of our paradigm. And so perhaps 
perhaps this topic, maybe, maybe we are just standing at the precipice of yet another paradigm moment for our species. Maybe this is just another beach and we're looking over a yet another horizon. So you said what we saw there was arguably the least compelling evidence that you've seen. What can you tell us about the most compelling evidence you've seen? Can you describe I can't. any of its characteristics? <laughs> is it, is it, is it pictures? Is it films? Is it, you know, what kinds of things? Yes, yes, and yes. It's videos. It's pictures. It's, it's the, the intelligence reporting. Um, you know, it's quite titillating when we, we look at a, a video like this and we say, ooh, ah, oh. But, but there's actually a lot more to it. We have hyperspectral technology. We have radar technology. We have capabilities that are airborne, capabilities in low Earth orbit, capabilities in high orbit, geosynchronous orbit. And when you, when you put all those resources together to collectively look at the same thing at the same time at the same place, um, it can paint a very compelling picture. And to put that on the backdrop, my country spends billions with a B, billions of dollars each year, investing in just one of those areas to get a little bit of an advantage. Remember I mentioned low observability as being one of those characteristics of, of UAP. Well, the stealth technology. We'll spend $2 billion on a single aircraft just so the radar cross-section is a little bit less. And yet these things not only are harder to see with electro-optical devices and, and radar, they're hard to see with the naked eye sometimes. And they can perform in ways that we can't. They can drop out of 80,000 feet, hover over the water, and then pop right back up again. I mean, you're, you're talking about the energy requirements to do that in a, in a, in a conservative way. Um, we, we still don't understand. We can't do that today. So a lot of people might look at this and say, look, if these things were alien, why aren't they landing on the White House lawn and demanding a meeting with the president? Great question. So uh, let's, let's, let's detangle that for a second. Um, how many times have we watched a nature show? And you look and you see uh, the wildebeest in Africa migrating and all of a sudden uh, a couple uh, humans fly in over a helicopter, scare the hell out of the herd, everything goes running and stampeding. Uh, and all of a sudden we dart one and uh, we take measurements to see the health of the herd and the migratory patterns and the diets and whatnot and we leave. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's far-fetched to, to think that um, some sort of intelligence would want to be disruptive necessarily. Um, we don't necessarily behave that way even as humans. So to assume that something's just going to land on the White House lawn, um, I, I, think, I think, I'm not sure that's really, I mean, look, we don't, we don't land right now uh, on the in, you know, Red Square by the Kremlin. Um, you just don't do that. You, you, you're, sometimes you want to be non-disruptive. How long do you think we've been visited for? Is this since, it seems like Flying Saucer, the, the idea of the flying saucer seems to be a sort of post-war phenomenon. Do you think it's you know, the last century, or do you think it goes back further than that? Fantastic question. Let me share with you a, an experience that I had at the, um, in Rome not too long ago. Uh, I had the honor and pleasure of sitting down with some individuals that were out of the Vatican. And there was a scroll, uh, and in this scroll it was written in Latin, and it was a communique between a Roman soldier and a Roman general some 2,000 years ago. And what they described in this communique was um, the, the name for the Roman shield is eclipus, means um, like eclipse, like a sun. And so they described these flaming Roman shields in the sky that would follow them from battle space to battle space. So it is quite possible we are dealing with something that could be, could be potentially, not necessarily even from outer space. Believe it or not, it could be from right here. It could be right from this planet, and we're just now at a point where technologically we're beginning to interact with it. I'll give you another case in point. Up until very recently, the last 100 years or so, we believed as a species there were only two types of kingdoms of living organisms, and that was animal and plant. And then about 150 years ago, we realized that fungi was its own kingdom of life form. And about 100 years ago, we realized there were these little microorganisms that uh, someone famously screamed, little beasties, little beasties. Um, and there's a whole uh, another kingdom of life form that has been invisible to us uh, since we've been homo sapiens sapien. And we just now realize, and by the way, the biomass of that one kingdom alone outweighs the total biomass of the animal and plant kingdom put together. And it's been completely invisible to us. So we have to be very careful going down that road when we say, well, if it's not ours and it's not from Earth, it must be from outer space. It could be, but there's other options as well. 
Now, we're almost out of time, but I'd like to have a couple of questions from the audience. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask Lou? I'm a Gemini. I like long walks on the beach. <laughs> um. uh, anyone at all? Any hands? There we are. Yep. Oh, sorry, there's a mic coming for you, I think. Oh, be yeah, it seems like um, we start talking about the evidence of aliens, in quotations, that people automatically assume they're coming here. To, you, you sort of touched on this. Um, they're automatically coming here to fight with us, to start a war with us, to take over our planet or whatever. I'd just like to hear more <coughs> about your theory on, um, or just touch on whether sure. you think that is a, a common... Yeah, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I, if I capture that. So the question is, you know, do I think this is a threat? And of course, I'm a product of U.S. national security, so we tend to think everything is a threat until we're sure it's not, okay? Let me give you a very quick analogy here. I, I think most of us uh, would agree at night before you go to bed, you might lock the front door just to be safe. You probably live in a nice neighborhood. You don't expect anything bad to happen, but just to be safe, you lock the front door. And maybe you even go as far as to lock the window before you go to bed, and you might even turn on your alarm. Let's say you wake up one morning and you come down to have a nice cup of, well, I'll say coffee, but here it's tea, right? Um, and you come downstairs and uh, there are muddy boot prints sitting uh, that are on your, on your floor, in your living room floor, under carpet, that weren't there the night before. Now, no one's been hurt, nothing's out of place, nothing's been taken, but despite you locking the doors and the windows and turning on the alarm, there are now muddy boot prints in your house that were not there the night before. The question is, is that a threat? Well, my response is that it could be if it wanted to be, so we should probably figure out who's leaving the boot prints. Now, there is a fundamental difference between, and I don't want to fear monger, I'm not saying these things are hostile intent. Threat and hostile intent can be two entirely different things. Hostile intent is the willful, uh, if you will, desire to, 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 to create harm. Whereas threat, you can have involuntary threats, you can have uh, environmental threats. If I, if I get on an airplane, there's no threat. But if I get to the back of the engine of that same airplane while it's throttling up, there's definitely a threat. There's a biological threat to me, right? I can, I'm going to get burned. I might lose my hearing. So um, we're still trying to determine that. That's a great question. I've literally got 10 seconds. So very quick question, very quick answer. <laughs> Not to be facetious, but the fact that we keep sending billionaires to space, do you feel there's any connection? Um, well, <laughs> sure, um, the fact that we've been seeing these, at least in my country, since the late 1940s, what you see here is described as a tic-tac, was described in the 60s as a white flying throat lozenge, in the 50s was described as a white flying butane tank. Um, we're, it's clear we're dealing with the same technology, and I'm not aware of any billionaires that would have that type of technology, again, temporally, you have to look at this from a time perspective way back then. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. Sorry that we have to wrap this up. Lou, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. I'll thank follow you, man. You.